Welcome back everyone, Quistine here with more Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires continuing my campaign guide series for the Tomb Kings. I just decided to split it up in several parts as things could have gotten very, very long indeed if I had just made one single video. And while making a two-hour video is something I've done before, I think it's probably better to just make separate videos. Anyway, when it comes to the Tomb Kings, I've talked about their legendary lords, their Tomb Kings, uh, their Lords, their Tomb Kings, and their hero choices, what you should focus on, what is important, all that. Basically, Necrotects are pretty important, though Lich Priests as well can be very useful, uh, especially because they can get the Elixir of Immunity, which makes them immortal fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Now, here's what you need to... Uh, what you need to know about the Tomb Kings. They've got free recruitment and free upkeep. None of their armies cost anything to maintain on the field, and all their units can be recruited for free. However, the issue is that they have unit caps. So you can only recruit a certain number of units outside of basic skeletal warriors and skeletal spearmen. You can recruit as many skeletal spearmen and warriors as you want, but if you want to get... Uh, tomb Guard, uh, Tomb Guard, Nehekara Warriors, Archers, etc. Then you will need structures for it. What that means is you need to maintain a fairly sizable amount of territory in order to get powerful armies. But that's not even the biggest issue. Because you can actually uh, recruit entire armies made up of pretty good units. For instance, over here, I only have a couple of skeleton uh, spearmen and warriors, and I've uh, like Arkan's army is mainly made up of Nehekara warriors, skeletal archers, and a cup and some of his starting units. The second army is mainly man made up of cryptkulls, Nehekara warriors, direwolves, some bats, and a casket of souls. So, it is qu you can reach, uh, you can make your armies, uh, you you can fill up your armies pretty quickly with. Uh, with units from the caps. That's not necessarily going to be too big of an issue. The one issue you are going to have is the fact that you have army caps. You have a hard limit to how many armies you can have. Arkan starts with two armies, but even he has severe limits. He is at a significant advantage, not only because he can get two armies early, um, and he starts with two armies, but also he, uh, he gets... Um, a very good structure with the Grave Hill, giving him a lot of Crypt Golds, Direwolves, and Fell Bats for him to recruit. He is by far and away the strongest Legendary Lord of Tomb Kings, at least early on, based on that. But okay, you have limited armies. How do you deal with armies? How do you increase your capacity? Well, you can play as either Arkan. Um, that's one way. The second way is through research. The way you do it is you go through, you go unlock various dynasties. There's six in total, and when you unlock the wisdom of a dynasty, you will increase your army capacity by one. Now, going with a dynasty, uh, each dynasty will also give you capacity to increase your heroes, lich priests, necrotects, tomb princes. I'll talk about uh, research at and probably in another video, but suffice to say. Uh, you do want to increase your army capacity for this. In fact, one of the best ways to do it is you almost finish researching a dynasty and then you start researching another one because when you finish researching a dynasty, the research rate is going to decrease, so it's going to take longer. But that's a luxury that not everyone can afford. Arkan can afford it because he has two armies and he's also got a great starting position, so he, can, so he certainly has room uh, to expand. Uh, the third way to increase armies is through the Mortuary Cult. This also will affect your hero capacity. Uh, and research, you can get increased hero capacity to, um, to heroes as well. That's also going to be important. Getting Necrotects in particular is the most important of all of them. I've talked about this in the previous video. But basically getting Necrotects is a crucial aspect in your campaign. Uh, as... Uh, they will give you a lot. They give you campaign movement range and they increase your unit capacity for certain higher end uni units like Tomb Scorpions, Ushaptis, um, and later on the big boy units that you can recruit from tier 4 uh, structures like Bone Giants. Um, no, no, the tier 5 buildings. Like they give you capacity for these units or one of these units for each Necrotech. So that's a pretty big deal because it will give you a lot of power on the campaign. 
if uh, if you if you get necro attacked. But when it comes uh, to armies and hero capacity, you either get the free research, or you get for playing a certain legendary lord, or you get for the mortuary cult. But what's the problem? Well, for research, yeah, you just t take time, but there is a limit. Um, but for research, or uh, but for research, there's some research, quite a little bit of it, that requires canopic jars. There's uh, also uh, research at the end of the tree here, the Heralds and Power, that also gives you one army capacity, but requires you to get all these Heralds, that's a lot of canopic jars, and to increase the capacity for heroes or an army, basically Lord and heroes, like, the, consider the army capacity as increasing your Lord capacity, because that's really what it is, it's like, how many Lords can you recruit and have active at the same time? Uh, the way... Uh, all of this can cost a lot of resources, like you need to have certain resource uh, types to do it. Like for instance, if I want Necrotex, like I, or, uh, I already have Golden Idols and I already ha have Marble, so I could get Necrotex, but I need Canopic Jars. If I want Army Capacity, that's 800 Canopic Jars. Here's the problem with Canopic Jars. They're gonna be the main limiting factor. Army Capacity is gonna be the main limiting factor to you being able to expand your uh, Empire very quickly and Canopic Jars is going to be a huge limiting factor in being able to increase your army capacity and hero capacity. Here's, why, here's how you get Canopic Jars. There's really only two major ways. Well, there's three. Four, if you want to be technical about it, but four is the fourth one is very limited. The first one is when you're fighting a settlement battle or an open field battle, I'm just going to ask resolve it. It's not the most ideal outcome, but I'm not going to continue this campaign. And when you fight it and win it, you get an option either to occupy a settlement or basically the first option with either an open field um, battle uh, or a settlement battle. That's how you uh, that's how you increase, uh, that's how you get canopic jars, but it's only 30, it can't go up. Now 30 when you need 800 for army capacity is an enormous amount and basically you'll be uh, spending a lot of the campaign trying to get canopic jars are there other ways to get canopic jars yes um, beyond battles you can also go to heroes and just get canopic jar hoarder on heroes and lords but it is free skill points and it isn't going to be a lot i wouldn't necessarily prioritize it uh, early on with hero with lords certainly not with lords maybe with heroes depends on the heroes depends on what kind of fight you have. For instance, here I'm about to go against Cetra. I don't have time to waste my skill points on that. Um, so it is, isn't worth it early on, but later on uh, it can be because we will give you a decent amount. But mainly you're going to get it through battles. Um, the final way to get it is through quest battles, but yeah, that's pretty limited, only 50. I feel that there's just too many limitations with canopic jars and i think the tomb kings i mean it was designed obviously for so that the tomb kings wouldn't just completely steamroll out of control i understand that but i also do um uh, i also do absolutely feel uh that they limited it too much from my personal uh perspective right here that the limitations were a bit too uh, severe when it came to uh, to canopic jar uh, usage. Like money will not be a problem. Like I have ten thousand gold right here. Um, it's it's enough to increase army capacity and to get everything else that I need. Like I'm constructing all the structures that I currently can. I don't have anything to spend money on. I mean I could upgrade the Great Desert of Araby uh, as well. Um, but basically, what, what all of this boils down to is your armies you will have limited a uh, limited number of armies but they're free armies you will have a limited number of units but they're free units another thing to also consider with the tomb kings is the following point your lords are immortal it won't show it but basically when a tomb a tomb king lord dies they won't die they'll just be wounded your heroes can be killed but you can, uh, on Lich Priest, you can get the Elixir of Immortality very quickly and be wounded instead. Uh, on the others, you need level 20 uh, to get it, to get Immortality. But basic, the basic point is, 
if you lose an army, the only thing, the only two things you're really losing with an army is the ranks on units and maybe the heroes. If you find an army in a rough spot and you know you're going to lose, just accept the loss or try and do as much damage as possible. Uh, but also, um, also just uh, get the Lord, uh, the, get the heroes out, assuming they don't have immortal. If they have immortal, you don't care. Fight the battle, try and do as much as possible, and recruit another one. Because if you lose an entire army, it's very, very easy to recover, as as the Tomb Kings. And that that is where their power lies. The disadvantage, the significant disadvantage with this, is uh, I really wish Arkan would stop talking. By the way. Uh, but the major disadvantage with the Tomb Kings is that because they have limited armies, they can find it very difficult to expand across the campaign map because with limited armies, one of the great things about the Greenskins, as an example, or the Vampire Counts, isn't that their units are so strong, it's that they can get a lot of armies to cover numerous sides of the campaign map, being able to expand uh, and take advantage of weak points. You won't have that situation. Your individual armies might be stronger than anyone else because you will get higher tier units uh, in in pretty much every army that you have. It's fairly easy to do, but you will have fewer armies uh, than everyone else. I wish that the army capacity, like the cost of Canopic Jar should absolutely be lowered. Um, should absolutely be lowered in a campaign or we should be given a way to get more Canopic Jars. Uh, to get past that. Uh, fi uh, finally, there's another way to increase capacity of various things, and of course, that's with the books of Nagash. Let's talk about the books. So the books uh, are go going to be in cell locations dependent on which legendary lord you're playing. However, what isn't going to be set in every campaign is what the books do. So that is randomized. So you can get a really good book right next to you. For instance, there as as either Cetra or Arkan, you will always get the book in a rogue army over here in this region. But what that book does, and by the way, this is a pretty strong army. Uh, I'd recommend auto resolving as opposed to finding things like bring two, maybe three armies and auto resolvers because this is a rough one to deal with. Uh, but what the book does will var will. Uh, change dependent on the campaign like not the lord when you start a campaign it's randomized so you can get a really good book close to you at the start of the campaign or you can get a really bad book now the books all are useful this one would give me casualty replenishment after occupying settlements or sacking them this would give me hero capacity for all heroes that's pretty good the hero actions not don't really matter but the hero capacity absolutely um the one over here in Caracade peaks would give me um Lich Priest's uh, Shadow, so I would unlock Shadow Magic, that's the best school of magic that you have access to. So there's a great deal of power. However, again, not all books are uh, are as useful. I would say that the there's four books that are really good and the other ones just not as good. The one that is the best, which in this case has spawned all the way here, right? Very, very far away. It's on a, it's, um, it's on a navy. In, uh, in the middle of a show, and it's, it's moving pretty far away. But this one is the best one. Why is that? Because it gives you an extra army capacity. And also gives you in a capacity 5 for Tomb Guard and Tomb Guard with Halberds. Now, the Tomb Guard doesn't really matter, but the Tomb Guard with Halberds 5 capacity is, is actually a fairly significant one, at least early on in your campaign. Less so later on, but consider this. A tier 3 barracks only gives you 2 Tomb, uh, tomb Guard or one Tomb Guard with Halberd. So you may struggle to get a lot of those. This gives you five of each of, of these units. Uh, looking at the book. So that's the best book. The fifth book of Nagash is the best book, followed by the first book of Nagash, that gives you hero capacity to all of them. So those are the two best books. And the third best book, where is it, is the fourth book of Nagash. So these are the three best books. The fourth one, that's pretty good. Um, and the, the fourth one that's pretty good, obviously, is the sixth book. You can also make an argument for the seventh book. But really, the fifth, first, and fourth are the best books by far and away. By far and away, along with the sixth as well for that School of Magic, which is the best School of Magic you have access to. So you have several uh, good books that you can get either early on in your campaign or very late on in your campaign. 
My advice when playing the Tomb Kings is start the campaign again and again and again. Always look at what books you have. When you get at least the army, like if you can get the army capacity one next to you, as well as maybe the hero capacity or, or the recruitment of Lich Priest Shadows, uh, then you will have a much better time in your campaign, a much faster time. Not necessarily easier, but it will be much better just being able to have an extra army. But you will always have limitations on how many armies you have, because even with that extra book, there's still limitations. How do you overcome those limitations? What can you do? Well, I'm sure there are some mods out there, though I haven't personally found any mods that uh, help with uh, the cost of increasing army capacity. Maybe some overhauls do it, I don't know. But there is a way. Uh, there, is a pr there is a way. The Tomb Kings can do something not everyone can. They can vassalize a lot of factions. So I'm pretty sure if you're playing uh, the Tomb Kings, you can vassalize a large uh, swath of uh, factions in your campaign. Though you may not want to do it with actually your fellow Tomb Kings. Because um, uh, the reason you may not want to do it is because there's a certain ter a certain special structures in the territories that the Tomb Kings have. The Black Tower of uh, Archon, the Pyramid of Various Kings, which give you significant faction-wide benefits. So when it comes to fellow Tomb Kings, having uh, uh, Archon the Black having a diplomatic negative with them does not matter at all. In fact, it's good because, yeah, you don't you want to actually take this territory. In fact, in order to win the campaign, you need to take that territory because you need all these pyramids, the Vault of Nagash, the Great Pyramid, etc. You basically need Toggling Fog of War to hold all all of this, more or less. So, for instance, over here, I'm actually going to cancel my agreements with with Manfred and actually take his territory for myself. You could take a vassal, uh, you could take a vassal um, as one of these factions and eventually trade, pay them for the territory, though just bear in mind that there is a hard limit in trading your capitals or asking for a faction's capital. They won't give that. Even if they have a lot of other territory, uh, they will not trade you their capital, which obviously creates uh, some annoyances. Here, I might just wait until uh, Manfred, like if I was going to play this campaign seriously, I would just wait until Manfred has wiped out, has been wiped out by the combination of Volkmar and Cetra, and then swoop in to smash both Cetra and maybe Volkmar. Um, but to get vassals, what can you do to increase uh, to uh, get vassals? Well, several things. You can pay for it. You can give money, and that will help with the odds. But as you can see with our pawns, I can offer her 10,000, and it only makes a 5 difference. Um, you can, of course, give them territory. So, for instance, the actual province that Arkan starts in is a very good province because it's safe, but it doesn't have any special structure, so I don't necessarily care about that. So, if I were to tra start trading with her, I could, you know, uh, I could increase the chances of the deal, but still wouldn't be enough. One trick you can do is you can start trading territory with a faction, get a lot of money for that territory. So, for instance, here, if I just give her uh, Lashiak, she will give me 2,000, and then uh, I can spend that money to increase my vassalization ch uh, chances. Also, uh, factions will like them more when you are trading them uh, an entire province. Like, say, for instance, uh, if I could, I would actually give her this entire province, the Wizard Caliph Palace as well. Um, she would like that. Uh, she would absolutely uh, like that. Um, but I can't because it's my own capital in the Wizard Caliph Palace and I can't change that. Um, but she w it would count towards the evaluation a great deal if I were to hand her over a full province. Or let's say she has two settlements in a province. For instance, I handed over, I no, took out the dwarves no, and handed no. over the mountains over here. Uh, the final region that I gave her counted a lot more towards the evaluation than um, the first one. For obvious reasons. Like, the AI likes it when you're giving them a full province, or they get full control of the province, and that counts in their daily evaluation. It's a good move by Creative Assembly. Or you can give the AI territory that is very valuable. 
For instance, for I don't know whatever reason, uh, Rapunz really loves if you give her the Great Desert of Araby because this is going to count towards the DL evaluation by a hundred, and she'll accept. She'll give me a lot of money and become my vassal. But it's not just Rapunz that I can do it with. Let's look at Volkmar. I would not necessarily want to vassalize Volkmar at this point in this campaign because I would want him to wipe out uh, Manfred. Uh, but let's say. But let's say I want him to become my vassal. Here's what I would do. I would give him... Uh, he doesn't have a direct line to the Great Desert of Araby. So I'm just going to give him El Kalabad. You are wise, get some money from it. All his money. Then give him the Great Desert of, of Araby. Get the trade agreement. And get El Kalabad back. I may want to cancel that trade agreement. Okay. And I've gotten... And I just basically gave him... The Great Desert of Araby for a vassalization agreement. But, and, and this is generally worth it if you're actually playing the Tomb Kings, because what does the Great Desert give you? Well, the reason that I love this, uh, pro this place is that it's a valuable territory. It does give you uh, a uh, some Ushapti benefits, but that's really it. Um, that's really it. The perfect vigor, yes, that's great, and it's, it's valuable, don't get me wrong. But between having Volkmar as a vassal, I will scour the enemies of between have, like, having Volkmar as a vassal, and that particular benefit early on in a campaign especially, I would say having him as a vassal is more I important. I can always get it back from him if I get a lot of money. Like if I really, really care about that particular benefit, I could get, I don't know, 100k or get more territory to trade with him. Or a combination of both of them, like a lot of money and territory, uh, and I would be able to uh, to get it back if I really wanted it to. But the AI does care a great deal about about that. And vassals, they serve two big purposes. Um, they serve two big big purposes. One, they give you money. Now. At this point, he's not going to give me a lot of money because, one, he's got a fairly weak economy at this point. But once he starts rolling in, once he gets more territory, he will give me a lot more money. We can talk about a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Uh, in another campaign, like in this campaign, for instance, uh, my vassals are providing about 10,000 income each turn, the vassals I do have. That's about half the economy that I actually have in that campaign. So vassals can give you a lot of money because the Tomb King economy is limited uh, due to due to the fact that it's designed around the idea that you don't actually need money for upkeep or unit recruitment. You only need it for structures and diplomacy, as well as certain things in the Mortuary Cult, as well as certain things in the Research Tree. But generally, you're using it to build structures. That's all, all well and good. Um, so while uh, so it it is balanced around that particular aspect. Um, and you end up actually with a lot of a lot of net income. Like right now, I'm I'm at a thousand net income, right? Like at a thousand income, that's actually a better net income than many other factions would have by turn thirteen. Because a lot of factions, of course, if you're playing a lot of lords, you would be spending a lot of money on multiple armies, not in the upkeep of those armies, the upkeep of heroes. As the tomb kings, you don't have to pay for that. Vassals do serve another purpose beyond money, though. Armies. See, this is one of the principal benefits that the Warriors of Chaos have, is that the Warriors of Chaos can get vassals very easily. You can't get that as easily. You don't have a subjugate button, because the way it works for the Warriors of Chaos is that when they take the last element of a particular faction, and if they can vassalize that uh, specific faction, uh, they can subjugate them and force them into a vassalization agreement. You don't have that. You have to engage in diplomacy, but I do find it very easy to do so. Like, for instance, yeah, I'll gladly trade over the Great Desert of Araby to have a vassal in Volkmar. And they I generally doesn't declare war on you. And, and when you vassalize them, your wars are going to become their wars. Their wars are going to end uh, instantly. It, it, Creative Assembly has done quite a bit to improve the vassalization system. Yes. And you can really take advantage of it as, as the Tomb Kings. Now, one thing to be said about vassals is that they won't instantly declare war when you declare war, but they will almost certainly declare war after a, a bit of time. Um, so, for instance, here, if I decide to declare war on 
Manfred, uh, Volkmar would follow suit. Now, the reason vassals are so important is you have limited armies, but you don't necessarily need the most powerful armies on every front. And what vassals do is that they can hold a front uh, for yourself. So, for so um, in this in this campaign, for instance, in, in this particular campaign, uh, I actually declared war on Tic Tac Toe, for instance. But I have done barely anything against Tic Tac Toe. Instead, my vassals, Rapons, Dune Kingdoms, all that, they've been fighting that war on their own. And while they haven't won it, they've certainly um, they certainly uh, taken quite a bit of territory from the AI from my enemies and crucially they've held them back the, like in the worst case scenario a vassal army fighting your enemies will slow your enemies down in the best case scenario they'll wipe them out and more often than not I find that they can trade pretty well so for instance if I get into a war with Mr. Scarbrand over here and I've got Volkmar and then eventually Rapunzel's as vassal vassals they can do a lot uh, against them. You can also obviously go and request armies and uh, request armies uh, from va from vassals or allies. Um, you can request armies once you get the legions, though it does feel uh, limited at times. Like, I wouldn't mind c controlling a vassal faction, even taking territory for them. I would not mind it at all uh, if that was actually an option. In fact, I would love it if it was an option, like if I had vassals and I had the ability to influence uh, the way they're building their economy, all that, like playing two campaigns at the same time. That would, I think that would actually be a lot of fun. Um, but um, you can certainly take a, an uh, allied army. There is, however, a nasty bug right now in the game when you do um, when you do request an army. Uh, in that, an allied army that you get is actually going to count for your army cap. This is this may not necessarily be an issue. Just be aware of it that if you're recruit if you're getting a uh, an allied army, your uh, cap is going to like it's going to go over the cap the maximum number of armies that you currently have active um, which may be an issue if you're trying to recruit an army at the same time though you can always give an army back like if you take an army through uh, vassalization for diplomacy you can always give it back instantly uh, you will lose all the legions points however but your campaign strat strategy is the Toon kings is to obviously get as many armies as you can get as many heroes as you can expand take as much territory as possible but also crucially, make alliances, make vassalization agreements with everyone. Like, Arkan is actually in a really good position to do so, surprisingly enough. Or Kalida, Cetra less so, but Kalida because she gets a diplomatic benefit with all factions. Arkan, uh, because he starts very close to the Great Desert of Arabif, which for whatever reason, well, we know why, because it's, it's got that special structure, but the AI loves taking it, counts a lot in terms of deal evaluation. But he's also got the diplomatic benefit of Vampire Coast and Vampire Counts. You will want to wipe out Manfred, though, but I'm sure no one is going to complain about that particular aspect. Uh, but you can make deals with... Uh, you can head over to Lustria to help Lufer Harkon, make him a vassal, make others a vassal. Uh, head over north um, fair winds and to fair Sartosa, time. make them Thanks your vassal. That. Uh, if you if you so desire, though, be aware that you don't like be aware uh, the, of the downsides here. That you may have to choose which factions you're getting as vassals. Sometimes, like for instance, Sartosa, a lot of the time may end up in a war with Belagar. Belagar is a much better vassal to have than uh, than the Vampire Coast, just because the Vampire Coast trades really badly right now in the campaign uh, in Atrozolf. Um so Belagar, I would argue, is a better vassal to have if you're playing counts. Like, if you're looking to vassalize uh, factions, always be aware of who hates who, right? Like, I wouldn't want to vassalize Manfred after vassalizing Volkmar and trying to vassalize Rapunz over here. Just my two cents on the subject. And that's what you need to know. That's what you should prioritize. Prioritize getting your army capacity up, focusing your research on that, uh, focusing your uh, saving canopic jars for that, Post battle loot, you may sometimes take the money of post battle loot on an open field battle. Uh, you may, 
You may replenish, you may increase your campaign movement range and get money, but generally if you can afford it, if there's no other factors like, oh, I need to move to another settlement or I need that campaign movement range, generally go for the canopic jars to increase that capacity. You will need it uh, to increase uh, your amount. You will need uh, a lot of canopic jars uh, to uh, to get things done. Uh, by the way, when, when it comes to vassals, some are more useful than others. I vassalized Rapunz, etc., as Arkhan, but I think if you're playing Arkhan, I I've actually believed that the Greybeard Prospectors might actually be a better choice um, of a vassal choice of a vassal a vassal option. I'm not sure how much they value the Great Desert of Araby, but it could be pretty easy to vassalize them. Like you take Lashiek turn one, you then take Ma uh, uh, Martek uh, easily Shall after we? that. You give it to them. Uh, you give it to them. And then you take the Great Desert of Araby, maybe with a secondary, with your secondary army. You take that, and once that's done, uh, you give it to dwarves. You need, you just need to have Martek. They just need to have Martek to, so you can trade it with them, and they might be a better vassal option than Rapunz. I mean, Bretonia is just not particularly amazing right now, uh, and you might want the territory Rapunz has for yourself because of. Uh, the various resources that do exist currently and that she does have Or you could get both uh, Actually, you could actually get both of them as vassals if you were to invest a bit more in that But there's always a risk because Rapunz doesn't particularly like you like well She does have a bit of an aversion not too much of an aversion Um However, it's only minus uh, 20. Maybe she should have more. <laughs> Maybe people should dislike Arkhan the Black. Like, this guy is ridiculous. Like, he's literally serving the closest... Uh, uh, he, he's literally serving the devil in the Warhammer universe. Um, in Nagash, and it's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll totally serve you, <laughs> says Rapunz. That is somewhat ridiculous. It makes sense with Cetra and Kalida, but I think Arkhan's campaign currently has a lot of nonsensical stuff like that uh, at the moment but that's what makes them so powerful but anyway that's all i have to say Quistine signing out don't forget to subscribe like enable notifications and i'll see you next time